As the presenters have mentioned, I was a student about three years ago, and I can honestly say that the NYC DSA bootcamp was the best professional decision I've made so far in my career. And it was also a really, really great personal decision for me for a lot of reasons. The first being that it allowed me to just understand problems that were being asked in different fields, read the news and have a better grasp of the statistics and questions being asked. I found I was able to ask more informed questions in pretty much any interview I went into. Um, and since leaving the academy, I had the experience of working one for a very large bank for about two years. And then after that, in my current role in a startup in the Bay Area, and I just want to give one disclaimer, I'm not speaking on behalf of either of those institutions. I'm talking purely as a data science alumna. Um, but what I wanted to offer you guys today is a sense of what you can do after the boot camp. And I think one of the biggest things a lot of students run into once they complete the boot camp is a sense of, okay, I have all of these skills. How do I find a role that I'm really going to be excited about and where I'm really going to shine? And that's the question I'm trying to answer today is how do you take all the knowledge that you would get from this boot camp and hit the ground running? Um, so <laughs> just to define the presentation a bit more, I've worked in a large bank and small startup. And one of the key things I've learned is that the role of a data scientist changes dramatically based on where you are. So what I'm going to talk about today is some of the different situations you may encounter and how to set yourself up for success after you leave the academy and basically go into any performance. So I'm going to be talking about things like defining your job search, uh, the role that you might have in a big bank versus a startup, uh, some of the commonalities, which is under what I learned in a nutshell. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about health and some final takeaways towards the end. But to introduce myself a little bit more, Again, my name is Katie. Uh, I got to NYC DSA from a bachelor's in neuroscience. I had actually come out of college and thought I wanted to be a neuroscience researcher. So I spent a ton of energy working in laboratories and uh, pursuing a research career until I got to a point where I realized I didn't enjoy research. Uh, I didn't want to spend any more time in consulting. And what I really wanted was a skill that would allow me to ask and answer important questions and that I could use in any field. And so that's what eventually brought me to NYC Data Science Academy. Uh, the first position that I did land out of the Data Science Academy was working in anti-money laundering at Deutsche Bank. So that's basically anti-financial crime and trying to uh, find patterns of risks in financial data. So something totally outside my previous field. Um, I took a short break to heal arthritis related to Lyme disease, which is why I brought health into the end of the presentation, as you'll see. And currently I'm in San Francisco and I work as a data scientist and product manager at a mental health startup called Total Brain. So that brought me back full circle to the field that I really, really enjoy, except I feel like I can engage with it in a way that's much more interesting to me, that's much more high level, and that gives me a lot more uh, flexibility and freedom. So jumping in from here. The first thing I want to talk about is defining your job search. And this is one of the first things that you'll encounter once you graduate a place like uh, NYC Data Science Academy. And the question is, OK, I have this information. How do I go about finding a job? And I actually received great advice from my brother on this exact topic, where he said to me, treat it like a relationship, no matter how much you want a job, no matter how much you need money to pay rent, uh, keep your standards and try to know exactly what you want and move forward confidently with that goal in mind. So don't become desperate. And some of the questions that I had to start asking myself, first off, were would I succeed better in a startup or a large company? Um, and that's a pretty fundamental question because those are very different data science roles. So do you want to work in a place with very few resources like a startup where a lot of things are being defined from scratch? Or do you want to deal with a large company where you may be able to get a lot more mentorship and support, but you'll have to deal with a lot more inertia? Uh, what size company do I want to work at? It's a related question. Um, and a big one here is what part of the data science life cycle do I want to spend most of my time working on? One of the things that 
uh, if you end up taking the boot camp, you'll realize very quickly is that data science is a single term for a very, very big field, which includes everything from ingesting data and pulling it in from different sources, whether that's spreadsheets or PDF documents or conversations with other people, maybe audio data. So pulling in that data, cleaning that data, uh, creating features out of that data, which is um, what you actually work with as a data scientist, um, and then turn and modeling it and turning it into something. There are also different roles based on the scale of the data you're working with. So are you someone who's trying to take information from 200 rows or are you working with terabytes of data? Uh, so there are a lot of questions in terms of what you enjoy doing and where you find that you have the most skill. Another question is, do I see a societal problem that I know a clever way to fix? For me, uh, I actually intended to get into agriculture initially leaving the academy. And so I started studying, okay, how, how do farms and how do companies define um, a successful output of crops? Uh, what do we know about nutrient output? Uh, what data are drones currently collecting in the field or farmers collecting? So that was something that I really dug into. And then do I wanna be purely a data scientist or do I wanna be highly involved with business and some sort of collaboration, which is what I've ended up in in my current role. And the most important question probably is what does it take for me personally to feel satisfaction? So do I need to see the immediate effects of my work? Do I need a great mentor? Or do I really wanna be making $200,000 a year or more and I don't care about the other details? And once you've gotten some of those things down, you'll find that it becomes a lot easier to find a job because you can reach out on AngelList, for example, if you know that you want to end up at a startup. Uh, you can find recruiters at LinkedIn for large companies that actively are seeking out data scientists and building their teams. Uh, you can network much, much more effectively and know what terms to search. For example, um, if you wanna be involved in the ETL part of data science, it's much easier to find other people on LinkedIn who have experience in those roles and can give you some guidance. So that's what I would say first about the jumping off point. From there, I want to talk about what it's actually like to be a data scientist in different environments. And the first one I wanted to touch on is working in a big bank because this was my experience for almost two years. And I would call that data scientist as integrator. Um, in my general experience, and again, this isn't specific to where I worked and I'm not speaking on their behalf, but part of the job ended up being working directly with the business and part of it ended up being innovation. Um, and when it comes to working in a large company, you have to find good ways to collaborate with the business people who are already there and communicate in the cases that they've often never worked with a data science before, scientist before. So what you'll end up doing uh, if you're working in something like financial risk management is interviewing a lot of people and understanding what are your current processes, uh, how do researchers currently define risk, um, and getting a sense of the existing flow of information. Going over to the, to the left side here, the business side, what I spent a lot of my time doing was talking with the, the business people and researchers and learning how they manually carried out this process. And then I collected the data that they used and started iteratively building models and seeing if I could replicate or do better than uh, the existing work. Um, I also included search for new typologies because working in financial crime, you build off what are the relevant risk factors. And so part of my job was to do research and find, are there any that we're not capturing and that could be built into um, financial models. Uh, when I put think like a business person, that really means um, what, what do you need to know and how will it impact the business and be very, very realistic and clear on what your models can and can't do. So for example, I learned very quickly that first of all, I didn't need a hyper advanced neural network model or something very sophisticated. I just needed maybe a simple regression based model. Um, and I also learned to be clear with the business people that uh, AI is not what they've seen in movies. You don't just throw a question at it and IBM Watson answers it. You have to build a very, very specific model to the question that you're trying to address. 
Um, and, and if you try to extend it beyond that, it often won't be valid. In terms of innovation projects, I also spent a lot of time talking with other employees in the company and learning what takes up most of your time. Is there any processes I could automate? Um, where are all the company resources going? Because one of the things I found is that in large companies, information is often siloed. People don't communicate with one another. And so as a data scientist, if you wanna be effective, you have to help ease some of those pain points and learn, okay, where can I automate something? How can I maybe make a dashboard that helps one department communicate what they're doing to another? So I spent a lot more time than I had initially planned just interviewing people and learning what, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, and is there any way that I can help you do so more effectively and to integrate with the rest of the company? And some of the most important things I learned in that were always, always test your work with the least technical business people in the company. Um, because if you, if you come in as the data scientist or the statistician and no one understands what you're doing, it's very hard to be useful to other people. And the other is invest in learning how information flows within the company. Um, because oftentimes in a large company, there are many, many legacy systems in place. And a lot of data is trapped in silos or areas where um, many you, you can't get direct access to it. So learn how information is moving. And if there's any information that's maybe been lost because someone's left the company or because uh, it's just stuck in a file somewhere and not accessible to people. Uh, final point, make sure your solution is robust. So if you're building an automation model, create something that's uh, gonna work and function even if you've left the company. So leave good documentation, uh, keep good track of your code and make something that's as efficient and well-written as possible. Some examples of data questions that I found myself asking all the time are what legacy systems are in place and what are their strengths and limitations? Uh, how does data move here? What are the very slowest processes? Um, do those working around me understand what I do? And who can help me implement changes in this environment? So I wanna to speak to just a few points here. Um, when it comes to what are the slowest processes in place, I found that this is a hugely valuable question to ask in a large company because often uh, if you ask an employee where does the vast majority of your time go, it won't be towards doing their job. It may be towards uh, clicking a series of buttons over and over again, or it may be that they're you know, collecting information and doing something by trial and error. So learn what's working slowly um, and try to fix that low hanging fruit, because if you're able to do that, then you'll win so, so many points at the company and, and you'll free up a lot of other people to do their jobs better. And when I put down who can help, help me implement changes in this environment, that one's also huge at many large companies because they often have a hierarchical structure that makes it difficult to, um, to find out who's the decision maker and who can help me put this into production. So find the engineers and architects who are gonna be able to help you take your models and actually bring them into the company so they can have a wider effect and learn that as early on as possible. <laughs> uh, and I gave the example of a negative news scraper. So one of my big research proje projects at my last job involved interviewing our researchers and finding where do you spend most of your time? And what I learned pretty quickly is that most of them spend a lot of time collecting and curating negative news information. So I eventually ended up uh, creating an automated project that went in, collected the negative news for them, filtered it, and curated it. And this was something that they didn't know they needed until we started to put it in place and make it available to them. So that's just one example that of a simple fix from my end that helped a lot of people um, or was very promising to their team in terms of getting what they needed done. I'll come back to case studies a bit later, um, but I'm gonna leave these in the presentation for anyone who's particularly interested in the area of anti-financial crime or AML. And I wanted to talk about a totally, totally different case, the startup that I work in now. And in a startup I've learned 
data science totally leads the way and it's absolutely key to whatever a startup is trying to achieve. And if any of you have worked in a startup, you know that it tends to be a very scrappy environment that's still defining its processes and figuring out you know, what direction to even go in, what's important to our customers. So I put data science at the center here and tried to show how it interacts with teams as diverse as design, engineering, customer success, and product. Starting from my own perspective, I'm currently a product manager and data scientist, and I found that that's a really, really good uh, marriage of roles because as a product manager, you're bringing in new features, uh, you're altering whatever the base product is, and it's very helpful to be able to have a hypothesis like, I would like to bring in this feature because I believe it'll increase user engagement by X percent or it will make our product stickier um, and to be able to prove that with data. So in my role, for example, I spend a lot of time creating hypotheses, making sure that we have event tracking in place um, to answer those questions. And then uh, once we launch something, having dashboards that allow me to see if my hypotheses were correct. So it's a completely iterative process uh, that I move forward with. And that's something that everyone else on the team is doing as well, is, is um, using data, not necessarily to drive their decisions, but to inform their decisions and sort of keep, the, keep our direction in the way that it needs to be from the engineering end, there's a lot of interaction as well. And, and you ask things like, okay, what's the best way to organize our data in a database? Should it all be in a data warehouse? Uh, who's in charge of maintaining and updating the data, which is a huge question when you're a very, very small organization and you're still figuring out processes. Um, customer success and sales is an interesting case because there's a two-way flow of data. And as the data scientist, you're um, sharing with customer success, look, this is how engaged our users are. This is how much they like this new feature. Um, and maybe information like we see that their stress levels are decreasing because of it. So that's something that they're able to take to our clients to, to prove the efficacy of what we're doing. And then they offer the data science team verbal feedback as well in the form of um, you know, the, the client would like to see this change added. This is what they've noticed while doing the registration flow that they don't like and would like to see fixed. So there's a two-way flow of data there. And then in terms of design, this is also a pretty key relationship because like product, design builds on hypotheses of how they think users are interacting with our product. And data is really the way if we confirm or deny that what we know is true. So that has a huge influence on the aesthetics of what we're doing. And startups use everything from like user testing websites to A-B testing um, to just event tracking dashboards to make sure we're headed in the right direction. Uh, some of the main questions that you have as a startup are things like, what are our KPIs and do, do we even have the data to measure them? So for those familiar with Google Analytics, Tools like that are very, very important uh, so that you can see uh, user activity through events on your website or, or app. Um, are there ways we can share data more smoothly between teams and really get it all in one place? Um, how can we make data accessible to as many people as possible within legal limits? I would say this question is going to get more and more important as more data protection laws are put into place. So more tools, uh, more BI tools are gonna to become common and companies will have to decide who within the organization is going to actually be able to touch the data and who is going to just see it represented visually. Um, what user experience are we trying to create? Does the data suggest we're succeeding? And I would also add, how can I document and structure this process? Because in a growing startup, uh, there's a huge turnover of people and team structure is very fluid. So to have something put into a document where others can easily see it and follow it is a very important way to go about things. And to give one uh, everyday example of these problems at work, in our current company, one of our big things is creating neuroscience informed games. And so one of the things that we often do is we'll put a game out there 
and we'll attach tracking to it so we can see how far are users getting in the game, at what point are they closing it out. And we've used that to refine a number of our games and we've discovered that in some cases, users really aren't clear on the instructions or they don't they don't understand the goal of the game at the at the outset so that's led us to actually ref, revise a lot of the instructions um, and write the goals of the games up front but we spend a lot of time observing what we could see of user behavior and time spent in certain games to see which ones users were just getting confused by and leaving before they even got very far into it Again, I'm gonna leave a case study here, but uh, we'll not touch on this at this exact point and may come back to it. In terms of large companies versus startups, uh, I broke it down into a few different sections so you can get a sense of it. But to give you a basic idea, at a large company, you'll often work as a pure data scientist, which means uh, you'll have a mentor, you'll often have a lot of financial support and resources, and the only downside of that is you'll tend to get siloed. Whereas at a small company, uh, you won't just be a data scientist, but you'll often have to think at times like a product manager, designer, engineer, and QA person at the end of the day. And you'll be expected to understand the needs and desires of the other teams as well. In terms of assignments, in a large company, you may get the chance to work on something really, really well developed. So maybe if you're in fintech you'd be doing highly advanced uh, modeling in terms of uh, neural networks or something along those lines or you may be in an industry that's just ready to start being disrupted and that would be something like construction or shipping and trade and the best way to figure that out is to um, either talk to a contact in that industry and ask what, what's automated and what's being done on paper or you can uh, look at the news and see what the main problems in that industry are, which is one of the ways that some friends and I found out that in terms of shipping and trade, there's a lot of room for disruption there. Um, in a small company, assignments <laughs> vary significantly. On some days, I'll be doing something that's high-level data science, and on other days, I'll be asking really basic questions like, do we even have data in a good, solid database at the moment? Um, and are, is everyone who needs to see it able to see it? In terms of infrastructure, uh, at a large company, you'll have legacy systems and databases that are well established by the time you get there. And right off the bat, you'll need to start learning how does this system work and how can I adapt myself to it? Whereas at a startup, you'll often have a say in the type of structures that are in place. So you'll have the chance to shape some of the flow of information within the company. And oftentimes you'll be able to help define how the company collects and uses data. So for example, working this startup, I've had to learn much more about APIs, uh, databases like Elasticsearch and Dynamo, their pros and cons. Um, so for a small company, I would highly recommend digging, it, digging in a bit, a bit to architecture and engineering to understand those details that uh, those those details that impact how data is going to be available, um, and you'll be partially responsible for making some of those decisions, most likely. Finally, I would chalk it up to at a large company, it's a great environment if you value stability, you want more resources, and there's a brand or proven company that you really really want to work for. In those cases you're in the right environment and you can count on a lot more mentorship and similar day-to-day -day activities. Whereas as a startup, it's fantastic if you want autonomy and flexibility to try new things. It's really a great way to learn a little bit about every role at once because it forces you into so much interaction with other teams. Um, but it does entail a lot of chaos. So you might spend one day doing data science and you might spend another day uh, just talking to other teams or trying to figure out why a database has gone down and you're not able to do anything at that moment. So you can't predict the day-to-day -day as much, but you'll most likely learn a wider variety of things that you didn't even know were part of a data science job. To focus on some of the, the commonalities that I found in pretty much all work environments and that friends have echoed me on, I would say 
coming out of the data science academy, you'll have a lot of knowledge and a lot of advanced skills. But in an actual work environment, the key thing to keep in mind is focus on the business problem and the low hanging fruit and don't focus on complex solutions. So for example, in my previous job, I met a lot of interviewees who wanted to say, let's throw a neural network at this. I know I read a math textbook. I know a very advanced solution, but they didn't realize that what we wanted was someone who was interested in our particular business problems and the easiest, clearest way to handle it. So focus on what's low hanging and what's simple rather than what's advanced and impressive um, because oftentimes in a company, no one around you will be able to understand you if you put in a highly complex solution. You want something that you're gonna be able to explain to other people and that if it goes wrong, you yourself will understand uh, why it's likely not working. So focus on the problem rather than the technique. Secondly, ask other employees about their pain points and watch what they spend most of their time doing. One thing I've found in pretty much any work environment is that other employees may not even know their immediate pain points, but as a data scientist, if you watch them go about your, their work, you'll see things that can be automated or things where maybe you can help them bring in more data to, to create a decision uh, that would give them better results than they originally had. Look for siloed resource sources of information uh, that can add to or give context to your data. And that's everything from look for documents that are currently in paper form to uh, talk to individuals who may have historical data and who are about to leave the company. And finally, grow beyond your role because uh, when I left the academy three years ago, a data scientist meant one thing, but nowadays it's changed so, so much um, that you become obsolete each year if you don't continue to retrain yourself. So you have to get interested in databases and their limitations, APIs and network architecture, um, event tracking and tools like Google Analytics, and more importantly, get very, very interested in your customers and their concerns. Oftentimes a data scientist is depicted as a backroom person who just focuses on the, the models and the techniques. But one thing that's become very clear in the environments I've worked in is that the best data scientists are the ones who talk to people and who know what problems are most relevant and what questions aren't being asked. Um, so it's very hard to advance if you don't get outside of the computer. And on that same note, the modeling itself, uh, like running an algorithm is a very, very straightforward process, but asking a question and cleaning up the data so that you can prepare to answer that question is a lot more of a sophisticated nuanced process. And that's more likely where you'll your time will end up being spent. So it's just a small Dilbert cartoon to give you guys a pause here. And this is also just a small example of some of the miscommunications that can happen uh, between management and a technical person. So keep this in mind as one of the one of the downsides of getting too technical in a conversation with a manager, for example. All right, two more slides. This one is very, very personal to me. And so I hope it can be helpful to someone out there. Uh, as you get into the data science field, there's a lot of initial pressure to spend hours at a time at the computer, you know, go all night on a project, really just work until it's resolved. But I would make the case up front for consider this a marathon rather than a race. And even if you love your job, you're not evolved to spend every single moment or day in front of a computer. So find a balance early and figure out what you need to do for your health and sustainability. And one of the reasons I mentioned that is I ended up with arthritis uh, while working at my first job out of the academy. Um, in my case, it was largely due to Lyme disease. But as I looked around at my other coworkers, I noticed that pretty much all of them ended up with shoulder problems. They were wearing braces or they had something similar to carpal tunnel. So what I learned from that experience is that you have to get a balance and get outside 
expose yourself to natural light, eat to reduce inflammation, which affects all of the conditions that I've just mentioned and even mental health ones. Uh, don't neglect your posture. One of my coworkers regularly did yoga and Pilates and I noticed that she felt uh, very healthy on a regular basis. I've also included some movement exercises like somatics and Feldenkrais and Alexander technique that really help keep your body aligned so that as you're working, you don't start to uh, slouch and have neck and arm difficulties. And finally, if you have coworkers who've been hurt, try to get the name of a good physical therapist or acupuncturist um, or practitioner up front so that even if you don't need them, you have resources in hand in case you need additional health support. The book Pain Free by Pete Ikuskiw was incredibly helpful to me. So that's just one that I would specifically call out. Some final takeaways. Uh, once you've finished a data science academy and you're out in the wild, as I'll put it, <laughs> there are a few things that you need to keep in mind for the long term. And one is you've just put in an exceptional amount of work but adaptability is really key. So if you don't continue to learn, a lot of your skill set will be obsolete after a year. Uh, I've been asked multiple times if people think that data science will continue to be a hot field. And my answer to that is always yes, absolutely. However, uh, it won't be the data science of five years ago. So the great data scientists will be the ones who ask really intelligent questions, who dig into the data, um, and are able to clean and shape it very well, and who are then able to communicate it in a way that's clear uh, and offers insights back to whoever they're working with. So data science is not in any way becoming obsolete, but uh, for any data scientist who's coming out of the academy now, they have to really think where are my strengths and how can I keep growing myself each and every year. Uh, interest and involvement in every step of the process is key. In my first job, this meant knowing what a SWIFT message was when it came to wire transfers, asking people what the meaningless data fields meant, because I would be given uh, Excel sheets with 200 columns of data and would have to really ask, what does the rest of that mean? And is there something that other people have overlooked? With regards to the next few, when I was in financial crime, I had to understand what's the history of crime, uh, what are the risks to banks, and what's going on in the larger legal political level that's affecting my industry. So basically, I had to go far beyond data scientist, data science to really get the information and ask the questions that would make me effective at what I was doing. I've also included empathy and insight down here. So I've said this a few different times, but as a data scientist, you have to also consider yourself a business person, an engineer and a leader because it'll make you better at your role. A lot of what you do, uh, like I said, in a bank, you're an integrator and in a startup, you're really in the center of the organization, uh, but you're touching every other role and you can only really be effective if you understand the needs of those different groups. And finally, don't expect other people to understand the technical aspects of your work. Um, I learned very early on that uh, even showing the results of a simple algorithm in the form of a chart confused a lot of the business people I worked with. Make an effort to be clear and collaborative because people will really want to work with you and they'll often get uncomfortable and won't engage with you if they don't feel that they can understand the benefits of your work or if they feel stupid that they don't understand math. So always make an effort to engage with people in a way that they can understand. And to end on a positive note, have a desire to keep growing, do side projects and read a lot of blogs. So I've included one here that I used to work with which is called Pro Bono Analytics. And that's a data science organization that pairs data scientists with nonprofits it's out of NYU, and to be honest, I'm not sure what their current activity level is, but it was a really great concept of getting people in touch with organizations that couldn't afford to hire a full-time data scientist and helping them get their feet wet. The blog I've included at the bottom is called Automating OSINT, and it's just a fun intelligence blog uh, by someone who goes out and almost solves crime or resolves social issues using data science. But the key here is 
have fun because one of the reasons people go to a data science academy is they want new fresh skills in their life but also they want to do something they enjoy on a day-to-day -day basis and have something really engaging that catches their attention again and that's the part that you have to work hard to to not lose no matter what your day job is like so keep being interested uh, look for ways to enjoy it and really that's all I have for you at the moment I'm happy to take questions but I want to end on a positive note this is a really interesting field so keep engaging with it find blogs that you enjoy find resources and documentaries and reach out to other people and brainstorm cool projects that you can work on together because this is such a great opportunity that you're at.